Whether you're a chestnut farmer, a food lover, or simply curious about this versatile nut, Branching Out with United Chestnuts is your guide to a thriving chestnut community. So join us as we explore the many branches of the chestnut tree, uncover the untold stories, and branching out together towards a sustainable future. Thanks for tuning in to the Chestnut Industry Podcast, Branching Out. I'm your host of this adventure, Melanie Jones. This episode finds us with Craig Clark of West Coast Chestnut, and we talk about a subject that is really pretty new to me, and that is growing chestnuts from tissue culture. Craig shares how he has been a hazelnut farmer for many years, but also has been experimenting with chestnuts and finding common practices between the two crops. Not too long ago, his son Sawyer reached out and shared some photos of what they're doing and said that, you know, he thought guests would be interested in this topic, and I absolutely know that you will. It's an amazing time to be in the chestnut industry and in this community. So please enjoy and think about sharing your updates and adventures on the United Chestnut Community Facebook group. Thanks again. Well, Craig, thank you so much for joining the Branching Out podcast today. Um, I met you through your son, Sawyer, who actually had heard the podcast and reached out and said, I think you guys might be interested in what we're doing uh, here in our in our nursery. So Let's just dive in and, and tell me a little bit about your background to start with. Okay, yeah, um, I'm here in the Pacific Northwest. We're uh, uh, just east of Salem, Oregon, and it's 53 and raining today, uh, which is pretty typical. Last week we had an inch of ice for the week, and uh, but uh, it's wet, wet, wet here in the winter time and dry all summer long. And so um, my background is I actually went to Purdue for a couple of years for my first couple of years of college. And then I took what's now called a gap year. My parents uh, thought I was dropping out of college and then finished up a few years later um, at Willamette with a degree in biology. Okay. And uh, so I had come from a family of five boys and uh, they are, I, I'm the, they're all professionals. And I always wanted to be a farmer from when I was a little kid. I don't know. And um, so I'm, my, my mom still is disappointed in me. I think. She's 93, so I don't think she's going to get over it. Uh, but so um, anyway, so I just wanted to always farm. And so I got out of college and got married and started working and farming in my spare time. And then in about 2004, I quit working and uh, my wife works. And we had a, a, a place here in the Sio area and started uh, to try to put together things, including part-time work and work on the farm to make enough money to be a farmer. So for the last 20 years, that's what I've been doing. And and for the 20 years before that, I was trying to figure out how to get to be a farmer. And, um, uh, and Part of that led me, there was an extension agent in Oregon in the early 80s, 1982, 83, who talked about chestnuts and just kind of a one-off deal. His name was Bob Rackham, and he was around for a couple of years and then retired, and then it all disappeared, but he got me interested. So I've been messing with chestnuts, grafting them and collecting them and doing all sorts of things uh, really since the early to mid-80s. And, uh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. So on your farm, you do have chestnuts, but you, you're raising other things. Yeah, I've got about 200 acres of hazelnuts, which is my real um, uh, job. We also do a nursery, did a hazelnut nursery. Uh, we're not doing that so much anymore because the hazelnuts, um, the, 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 most of that acreage is, that we can put in has probably been put in. Um, and previous to that, we did... Uh, I had 20 acres of blueberries. I wrote tilled them out. I tell people I'm a non-traditional farmer. When something quits making money, I stop doing it. And uh, blueberries just got to be a, a, a miserable business and no fun. It. And so we wrote till those out. And we now have a <clears throat> six or seven year old hazelnut orchard in their place. So, uh, and, and that's really what kind of got this tissue culture thing started in me. Um, was uh oh 25 years ago oregon state they came out with a new eastern filbert blight which was killing the varieties of hazelnuts that we had out here in the willamette valley and they um 
developed programs to save the trees that were here with fungicide sprays. And uh, so they came up with a program for five, I mean, it's five sprays in February, March, and April, which around, and it's, you know, it's got to be dry for a few days. And around here, it's hard. It, anyway, it's a hard schedule to keep, but you got to get the fungicides on and the trees die back slowly anyway. And your orchards look bad because yeah. anyway, it's a tough business. So they put together a foundation and started developing uh, EFB resistant trees that Oregon State University did. And um, and then after 20 years, they developed some, and that's when I started planting them in 2008 and 2009. Uh, but the the thing that really surprised me about that or was they were able to develop a variety that there was just a couple of trees in an orchard in Corvallis, Oregon, at Oregon State University. And within a year or two, they could have hundreds of thousands of clone trees for farmers to plant. And that was all because of tissue culture. Uh, yeah. Being able like, to- Was it, was, was it uh, like students working on this or just- No, the no it, was, uh, it was an endowed chair by the hazelnut industry and Sean Ellenbacher and three or four other PhD people were developing and breeding, traditional breeding and all that kind of stuff. But once they got the trees, that had the right nut size and the right nut fall and the right, all the things they needed and were resistant to the Eastern filbert blight. They were able to put them into tissue culture and, and dispense hundreds of thousands of them within a very short period of time. And so, uh, it, you know, on a traditional, uh, stump culture, which is the way they've, or J rooting, which is the way they've done hazelnuts, it had probably taken decades to get that many. Uh, trees together with tissue culture. They just, it's a, a somewhat complicated process, but it was just stunning that we went in from 25,000 acres of hazelnuts in the Willamette Valley um, in five years, went to a hundred thousand acres. And those were all tissue culture trees and, you know, at 200 wow. trees to the acre. So it was just millions of trees were developed through tissue culture clones in a short period of time. So that was pretty amazing. That was it. That so, was a good, that was a good business learning and revenue learning, I guess. Um, as far as oh, yeah. if you're going to be in this, you want the best nuts. And we've talked about that on the podcast with where the chess side industry is. Um, yeah. And I guess I, I should have set the table a little bit better that when, oh, yeah. when your son, when your son saw you reached out, it was because of the conversation around the tissue culture of what you're doing, taking that learnings from the hazelnuts into the chestnut community. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, well, one day I was on one of my farms and, and I was, I always just been a bit of obsessed with chestnuts and I've always thought it would be a good uh, opportunity, but I've grafted them for decades and uh, layered them at times. And um, they're, the grafted ones always died back eventually. And as a nurseryman, I shouldn't say always died back, but frequently died back. Nurseryman, you sell somebody a $40 tree. And then they forget to water it on the 4th of July holiday because they're gone and it dies back to the graft. And now they've just got a seedling. That's hard for me to do. It's, anyway, so I was sitting on my tractor one day thinking, you know, I'll bet if we could tissue culture these chestnuts. This was five years ago in March. I said we could solve those problems, get clonal varieties, have orchards that were 90% one variety. The nuts would all fall at the same time. Be the, You know, just be like, everything else like almonds, pistachios. And uh, yes. so not knowing anything about tissue culture, I thought, oh, I'll start calling her out. So I did. Yeah, fantastic. Now, you, you mentioned in some of your info to me that you're working with some universities. Are they mostly up in the Northeast or? Well, yeah, actually, that's kind of come just recently. I mean, in the last few weeks. Uh, okay. I should be clear, the first two years, uh, we made zero progress. We were 100% failed um, for two years. Chestnuts are, uh, tissue culture is uh, the initiation phase. of Getting a, a plant into culture can be very hard. And, and that's, I think, the reason that chestnuts haven't been tissue cultured yet is because of that huge failure rate 
Um, Syracuse University in New York's done a little of it. Michigan State's done a little bit of it. Uh, Jeff Sarnowski in New York, he's a hobbyist like me, had did a little bit of it with some colossals. But it, it's very um, a very sensitive process, and it's hard to get them initiated in tissue culture. Once they're in and going, then you can just go bananas. But that first part can be very difficult. Yeah. So, so your your um, your biology background and education, I guess, kind of came more to the forefront versus yeah. farming on that, didn't it? Oh yeah. And then I, uh, uh, you know, went online and ordered some books, and then I started calling around and bumped into some really great people. Talked to a lot of tissue culture labs who are I mean, it, the initiation phase. A lot of uh, labs will say, "We'll initiate this for you, but you need to pay us ten thousand bucks up front, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work." And so um, I was asked by one uh, outfit we're talking with, you know, do you have a secret sauce for t for tissue culture and chestnuts? No, <laughs> we just kind of hung with it for, I mean, we sold our first trees last fall. Um, and so that was four and a half years in that we got our first tissue culture trees, 40 inches tall in one gallon pots ready to sell. So That's it's fantastic. Yeah. Do you, do you have do you have an inventory of people listening to this or are interested? How how is the process for you? Um, yeah, we are. Uh, we're um, <clears throat> we're talking to uh, Ron Rivard. Is going to sit. We don't have any. Chi I'm on the West Coast, and yes. and I don't have any good Chinese varieties, and which are really what's uh, needed back east and in the Midwest. And um, we kind of, through having that little bit of success, we've been able to get a little attention. And they're sending us some their top eight varieties of Chinese chestnuts. Uh, they've got to be quarantined. And we've got a extension agent here that's got the regional nut farm, nut and berry place extension agent that he's going to receive them and quarantine them for us. So we can try to put some pure Chinese uh, uh, chestnuts into tissue culture so that's that, fantastic uh, yeah, yeah doc, doc, dr reward was a guest on the podcast a while back and he talked about his vision is there will be a day when chestnuts are tissue culture preferred, but that are we sure that we have the best trees now to do that with but i think yeah. the learning the learning has to happen while we're figuring out if we have the best trees for you know all the dear, different okay. variables of a tree but wow that that's really exciting yeah, so they're they're sending us those. We have, um, you know, this year, um, to just to, to give you an idea of how uncertain it can be, last year we thought we had Colossal and Boch de Betazac in culture. And we got them to the, to the nursery that grows them out for us so that there was. And the Boch de Betazac, for some reason, in culture, just pooped out. Huh, okay. And and I mean, it it looked like a, a go, go, go. It was already good go. And we, we just got hardly any trees. And we got 2,500 colossals. And, you know, as far as, so anyway, it's just, it's there, it's an art uh, form. And we're kind of discovering some things that the, the time you take the sample from the tree, the, oh, I should probably explain the process just a little bit. Huh? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Back up and say, you know. And and okay, well, so first of all, you, I think you said that you had a number of grafted trees that after ten or even fifteen years they would start to die. Is that right? right. Yeah. And then you're like, this is this is pointless. But there's got to be right. a better way. And that got you to the tissue culture investigation. Yeah. Okay, so tell us what you found. Well, so yeah, out here, a lot of times it isn't ten or fifteen years. I, I've got thirty year old trees here at my house, chestnut trees here at my house. Um, that were grafted in their seedlings. And I don't have any trees that were grafted that I planted in the early 90s that still have live grafts on them. And um, I I mean, that's partly care because they, they're in like a horse paddock, not in an orchard. Um, and it, I think it's partially climate out here. They're, um, uh, we have extremely dry summers and uh, everything needs to be irrigated and they really aren't irrigated sufficiently or some years not at all so they survive fine they do fine but it stresses them and i think if you stress a chestnut tree there's just a bad result 
and the bad result on a grafted tree is it will die back or in danger of dying back to a graft. So I thought if we could tissue culture these trees, then even if they died back, the stump sprouts would still be 100% uh, genetically identical. So tissue culture 101. This is a little, this is just a piece of a house plant I broke off. And if in regular um, propagation, you'd take this and dip it in a little bit of solution or powder, rooting hormone, and stick it in a pot. And then you would water it and take care of it, and it would grow a new plant. And okay. if everything worked well, it would grow roots. It would use the energy stored up in these stems and leaves to produce roots. And then once the roots were produced, it would return the favor and the plant would grow. And that's regular cuttings. For tissue culture, we'll take just this little piece here, which you will hardly be able to see, which is the point. And in tissue culture, it can actually be one cell. It, okay. In practice, we don't do one cell. Um, in, in practice, we normally just do a, a bud, uh, maybe a quarter inch long or three eighths of an inch long. We, in this bowl, instead of having potting soil, we have basically jello with various hormones and um, the same hormones that are in the stuff you dip your regular cutting in. And then some nutrient stuff, some sugar, some NPK, some lo lots of little salts. And we put that in there. This has been autoclave, so it's sterile. And you put that in there under a hood with filtered air so that it remains sterile because anything, any mold or bacteria in there will just explode because that gel is fertile, good to go. And you'll just, yeah. the whole tray will be wiped out. So it's, you've got to rinse, rinse, rinse clean those up and put them in tissue culture. So it's not really a new process or greatly different from cuttings. It's just, yeah. it's a tiny little cutting. Huh. So. Wow. When, so if you're testing, this is going to show, I, I don't know too much about this, yeah. but that's okay. Yeah. Is it, is it, is the, um, the liquid in the, in the tray or the cup, do you experiment with that or that's a set known? Uh, um, no. And, and it's very, very critical in, to to get the right mix of stuff, the right mix of hormone. That at first you use hormones that, that stimulate upper growth, and then at some point in the process you change the gel, cut it up. That little plant gets bigger. You cut it up into fifteen little pieces, or four or five little pieces, and put it in a different gel, and then that'll make it to grow roots and shoots. Yeah. And then once the roots and shoots are maybe a half inch long you put them in a little peat pot in a nursery tunnel with humidity and grow so uh that's the first that, four months wow that 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 is extremely labor intensive but if yes. when you figure it all out it's going to be all worth it well yeah that's the hope um uh yeah you never know on, on these things but the, the other thing it's very um like with uh hazelnuts uh, even the variety of the tree. So they came out with three or four varieties of hazelnuts that they were tissue culturing. And a couple of the varieties that they had for pollinators, they had a terrible time getting them into tissue culture. So, I mean, they, they were the same hazelnuts from the same program. And some of the varieties needed a little tweaking or so um, we found that with um, the chestnut varieties we're working with now, which are um, I think this year we'll have Gillet and Seago, Boch de Betazac, Colossal, Oki, maybe another one or two. But some of them, oh, we've got Tora Curry, uh, which is a really good um, West Coast cultivar. Uh, yeah. um, and That's why you need the Chinese. Uh, you need to add the Chinese in, don't you? Right, right. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, we've, we've got, I, there's, I think one of those has, oh, we got Sago, and it's got a little bit of Melissa in it. And so we're, we're sending some of those back to the East coast to see how they'll take it. But, um, uh, but each of those is different. So, so for instance, uh, just on the, the Tora Curry, we've probably got 2,500 plants. We all started, they all started the same day. That, that's the same starting line with Tora Curry. They're just super vigorous in culture. And we've probably got 2,500, maybe 3000 of those that would be ready to go. Uh, we're going to multiply them again a time or two, but we'd be ready to go right now. Uh, 
uh, into the multiplication phase. And with uh, something you like say, so uh, we may when you say multiply them again, what does that mean? Oh, once you get them to grow and you get them up to an inch or a half inch log or something, you pull them out of that auger, put them in the, the uh, filtered air desk again, and you can cut that into three or four or five pieces and put each of those pieces back in a test tube or in a tray with that auger in there. And so each, every two or three weeks, you can multiply times depending on, you know, uh, some of these we'll get four or five in two or three weeks. So we'll yeah. quadruple each time we multiply every two or three weeks. Some of these, and that's, that's why we have so many tour queries is because they multiply really good. Um, gelées, we've got them in culture, but they maybe they take three or four weeks before we can divide them. And then we maybe only divide them in two. Yes. And so okay. it's a lot less slower. We're, we're hopeful that with these varieties that they'll get better at being in culture as time goes by, but sometimes what we just, nobody knows. You know, nobody we don't knows. know. Yeah. Nobody else knows either. So. Every, I mean, everybody says that it's just, it's very exciting time to be in the chestnut industry. Yeah. It's still very early in America, but it's like you said, what you're doing and, and other people are doing in different ways. It's, it's really pretty exciting. Well, You've been listening to episode 11 of the Branching Out podcast hosted by Melanie Jones. Today, Melanie has been joined by Craig Clark, owner of West Coast Chestnut, a family-owned and operated nursery focused exclusively on making a wide variety of chestnut trees available to growers across the U.S. The company uses tissue culture propagation to produce trees with known growth, production, and nut qualities without the risk of graft failure. Visit westcoastchestnut.com for more information. That's westcoastchestnut.com. And now, back to branching out. So is there any more to that process? Or is that uh, so Not really. Uh, we then, then it just an, a regular nursery thing. I think we've got some pictures on our website. I don't know if you have them, but like um, last year with our Colossals, they come out, they're about two inches tall. Uh, we potted them on between May 5th and May 10th, and they averaged over 40 inches tall in October. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, and just leaves, and they were just, they were just grew gang, gang busters. So the, the other part of this process is, is that because of the rapid expansion and growth, um, the, the, the tissue outgrows the viruses that have encumbered it over for its lifetime. And so you can, uh, you can eventually uh, produce virus free or reduced virus stuff plants over the span of their years, blueberries or whatever develop viruses that become endemic and get propagated right along with them. With this process, you could outgrow the viruses and can wind up with either less virus in the plants, which helps their growth. Or um, in some scientific places with meristem culture, which was a little more than we do, uh, you can eliminate uh, yeah. viruses entirely. So that's exciting. Yeah. And we have to to see a place some time to go by to see how the trees do once they get in the ground and if they're consistent in nut oh, production yeah. and in, in all that. But it's this is the first stage of it. Um, are you involved in the Chestnut Growers of America or? Northern nut growers or anything like that. I'm I'm a member of both of those, and I've just <laughs> learned a tremendous amount. Uh, there's a Facebook page, Chestnuts is a Tree Crop. Yeah, and I just I man I, I I was telling you before we started. I I uh, I'm kind of a nursery nerd and a hazelnut grower. I'm not. I didn't know that much about chestnuts, and I've since run into people out here who know a lot more than me. But online, particularly, just learned. A, tremendous amount i was used to listen to uh, uh uh james michael nave or nave uh -huh. on your podcast the other day he and i have typed back and forth he's recommended some varieties for us and just trying to get hooked into this community of people who really got a lot of smarts about chestnuts and and this is kind of an area that um that we can that we can lead in um yes yeah, that that's great. Uh, I hope you'll consider if maybe you already are of attending the meeting this summer and 
up in uh, upstate New York, the Chestnut sure. Growers of America. I mean, you uh, might even you might even consider doing a presentation. Well, actually, now see, now that Sawyer's the business guy, and I'm the uh, my okay. son, and uh, I'm the nursery guy, and so he, he tells me what to do. So I <laughs> he so may send me a ticket in the mail. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So. Yeah, that that's fantastic. So speaking of how, how so you, you guys work together, the two of you, is there anybody else in the family that's kind of involved in this? Well, uh, I live in Oregon. Sawyer lives in Sacramento, California. Oh, okay. And so we work together online. Um, yeah. This is, he's, uh, he's involved in agriculture. He's a, a large private equity company that does uh orchards, uh, almonds, pistachios, and dates in California and uh, Arizona. And okay. so he, that's his main job. And he just works out of his house, talks to bankers yep. and lawyers and stuff. Um, uh, but, but he does have uh, farms that he manages or he manages the managers of the farms. So uh, okay. he does that. I have another son who's got about 30 acres of hazelnuts here that lives in locally. And, um, He's a construction guy, does agricultural buildings and food processors and kind of large things. And then I have another daughter and her family live in the Sacramento area as well. She's a okay. builder. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I've got two kids in agriculture. Uh, Sawyer's really quite the surprise. He, uh, you know, I always told my kids they could work for me on the farm, but they didn't have to work for me on the farm. And Sawyer worked at the sandwich shop in town. <laughs> But, but now that he's 32, he's thinking, oh, he's interested. Yeah, there's, there's, there's something to this. Is that, so are, are your chestnut trees, are you producing and selling chestnuts? Uh, not really. I've probably got a hundred, I've probably got a couple acres of chestnuts here. And, but uh, it's mostly uh, experimental stuff. Yeah. Uh, I've got some old trees that I got from Mike Dolan at Burnt Ridge in the early 90s that are big trees. We eat those and share those. And uh, one of them's a colossal. People ask why I started with colossal. It's because I've got one in my horse paddock. And I mean, literally That's just right. cut some branches off it and got started. Um, so we're not really producing. Um, uh, I probably have 25 or 30 different cultivars grafted onto those trees. Um, and I've what I've done is I put them in the middle of a hazelnut orchard so they're on drip irrigation i'm treating them like hazelnuts okay as far as spray program and everything and just to see what works for chestnuts i mean they're on the same row spacing so i don't me or my the guy who works for me that sprays we just spray those rows with herbicides or whatever we're doing because nobody knows what works for chestnuts no i and, think that's uh, that's what we need we need yeah uh J and you said that the other day, we just need some people to have the space and the patience to try testing things and then right. share that knowledge. I was curious if you think like the the um, uh, gathering the nuts is similar between chestnuts and hazelnuts, like chestnuts are a little bit hard and uh, are there similarities or? Um, yeah, uh, actually I think um, uh, FACMA and Deflute and Monchero, all Italian uh, harvesters. I own a Deflute. Uh, if you look okay. online, uh, it's a 130 horsepower machine that sweeps and gathers and puts in a, a bin in the back for hazelnuts. And uh, I everything we use in hazelnuts can use in um, in chestnuts. And if you look we, at until Deflute, they're you'll see they're out pick of it up chestnuts. So yeah. Sorry. Do you do you wait till they're out of the burr? No, we, we won't. Um, huh. that, we really haven't harvested a row of them yet or anything. But uh, that's one of the things about clones. I was talking to a guy and I was saying, you know, if you plant seedling trees, you'll probably start dropping nuts in July and they'll probably still be dropping nuts in November. And you've got to pick those up frequently. And yes. if you had 100 acres and you needed to cover it 8 or 10 or 12 times a season to get the nuts that would really be harsh. But if you could have a clonal orchard, all the same varieties, or at least the same varieties in most rows, then um, you could get her all done in three or four weeks. Yeah. And all the nuts would fall at the same time and be of the same size. So, I mean, that's a really... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, 
it's like Greg Miller. You know Greg, don't you? Greg I, and Amy Miller. I've heard the name. Yeah, they're okay. they're they're fantastic. Well, he was a guest, and he was saying one of the most important tools in his uh, business is his chainsaw. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because they period of time goes by, and you're like, that get rid of that tree, right? Uh, or graft to it, or something, because it's just not performing. And I think over time we'll probably have trees and orchards where we are saying we've got a much better consistent uh, tree that we could graft to right. it or cut these down and start over in, in areas. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's neat. When they talk, I mean, it's so expensive. And, and this is really true on the West Coast for sure in orchards. But it's true everywhere. Is It's so expensive to own ground. I tell everybody the most expensive input that I have is sunshine. Because an acre of ground out here costs a ton of money. And, um, I mean, like water is cheap compared to sunshine. And um, so you really can't, you really have to get in production, be in production, have a system for production so you can really make money at it to really make a living at it. And yes. uh, that, yeah. that's kind of where we'd like to head. Okay. Um, so, well, you talked about the, the process of tissue culture, but you want to just kind of do a quick summary of what the benefits are of having, say, 10 years from now. What's the benefit of having some of your uh, tissue culture trees versus another option? Yeah. Um, there's some benefits and there's some downsides, too. Uh, they're not big downsides, but one of the things we've learned with hazelnuts is uh, tissue culture trees are immature. Um, they call it juvenility. And so for the first couple of years, you'll probably have no flowers or burrs on a tissue culture tree. You know, frequently you graft a tree and it has burrs on it that first year yeah. um, because it's mature wood going on there. This is juvenile wood. And so you won't get any of that for two or three years. Uh, nobody knows for sure how long. In hazelnuts, it was two years pretty standard wise there'd be no catkins no blooms uh, so you'd expect that in chestnuts um one of the biggest advantages is is that every tree in the orchard and most orchards will probably be 10 or 12 or 15 percent pollinators as well so it, when i say a clonal orchard that will mean your main variety and then pollinating varieties because a lot of the really best production varieties don't produce pollen yes. uh, at least okay at least with the Japanese and European ones that we work with. So like Colossal and Butch de Betazac um, are, are pollen sterile. So they need pollinators uh, and many of the trees do. So when I say clone orchard, it'd be, you know, probably 90% of your trees or every fifth tree and every third row or something would be a pollinator. But then every tree in the orchard has the same size and kind of nut that falls at the same time. Um, and just as far as harvest and pruning and all that stuff, it just makes it so much easier. Um, yeah. Same with fertilization and, and just all processes um, in an orchard that you would use. Um, to have cloned trees just makes a ton of sense. Yes. How, how, how long before you think we'll, we'll be there that growers can say, hey, we've got primarily little trees? You know, I, that's probably a better question for Sawyer, but I wouldn't, I, I'm not supposed to say crazy things, um, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if we could have by the fall of 2025 or 26, hundreds of thousands of trees available that were 40 inches tall in pots in that, that, that would be a uh, European sativa West coast trees. I'm very confident that with the uh, Melissima trees that we'll be getting here and just starting in on, you know, we may go another five years. Bef you know, it, it, it may be either super easy that I keep, yes. keep reminding everybody, hey, maybe we'll just stick these in the auger and put them in the chamber and they'll just blow up. Or we, there's varieties of hazelnuts that blow the tops off of these things. They're so, they so love being in tissue culture. Um, but, but it, it's just as likely that the Melissa trees will be difficult and they'll be different than, um, these, uh, hybrids we use out here. So, but if, okay. you know, if they go good, I'd say two or three years, it would be hundreds of thousands of trees. You'd be able to order, uh, you know, plant a hundred acres of, a of, a 
the variety that Dr. Revord had recommended to us to try to grow. And, okay, and then they could help you with the culture of the things, how to manage an orchard like that and stuff. So. That's right. Yeah, we're a, we're a breeding member for his, their, their uh, just that improvement network. Oh, okay. And that's, that's what it's about is learning and testing and giving feedback. You know, it's voluntary, but um, I mean, it's, it's just a part of the conversation. So what do you yep. see your, what do you see your work entailing, say the next five years? Well, I'm 67 years old. What? And, so, okay. and I've got eight grandchildren here and in Sacramento. And uh, I'm kind of, I, it took, all my friends that are farmers my age are retiring. And, but it took me about 25 years to get to be a farmer. So I'm not, not tired of doing it yet. And oh, yeah. um, so I, I would like to, and plus my mom's, my parents lived a long time. And, and so, you know, as, as I've reflected over the years, you, you can run out of things to do before you run out of living. And so I really yeah, yeah. hope to continue to, uh, you know, we live on the farm here. Hazelnuts are a great crop We that's mechanically harvested. And I hope to be, you know, 91 and driving the forklift that harvest while my granddaughter and grandson are driving the picker and the forklift. And just, will. yeah, will. just, you, you, you're not, you can't retire. You've got way too much going on in that brain. I can tell just, yeah. you know, yeah, and just know put her around. That. So, uh -huh. yeah, I really see that. I, I, uh, you asked about going to the New York meeting and, and uh, Sawyer said, yeah, you really need someone like you to go to those meetings. I mean, he can hook you up with the sales and he's starting to learn a lot about it, but they really need somebody who's a farmer and a nurseryman and something like that to really ask the kind of questions and answer the kind of questions that will be to get these things launched appropriately. So totally. I can see in the next few years traveling around a little bit more. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, You'll you'll definitely want to talk to Greg Miller and the and Amy Miller too, and yeah. you know knowing knowing Mike Nave that's fantastic and uh Roger you know Roger Blackwell there's there's just a lot it's really good because you get out and you get to have one on one conversations with yeah. people that are on the same journey doing different yeah. things maybe so I'll I'll look forward to meeting you there huh. and uh, we'll we'll tell Sawyer you won't say anything crazy yeah uh, well <laughs> hey, yeah and we really see. Uh, it really seems like there's an opportunity here to to make this something that people can do for a living. Oh, it it, it is. That, it's um and to get the right kind of trees, the right kind of information and and, uh, and what a great opportunity. I also think it's a great I'm all um regen I, my all my acres are managed regeneratively. We graze sheep through our orchards and do cover crops and all that kind of stuff. Uh and 30 of my acres are certified organic. Um, nice. It's just, it's been a really good business decision to do that. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, but I'm not converting more because the market's getting a little dicey on the organic nuts, but just to try to kind of be out there on the edge of things. And that's where, you know, people who, um, if you're new to the business, that's kind of where you got to start. Cause if you want to do what everybody else, if I wanted to grow corn and soybeans in Iowa, you know, I, I couldn't do it. You know, so I don't, don't have enough money to buy the big tractor. To, you know, I, unless my dad did that, I can't do that. But chestnuts, I think people can do that. Yeah. Right. If we get co enough co-ops where, yeah. you know, growers are coming together to pay for the processing and and uh, the sales and marketing to the American consumer, that has to continue. But that's, I, I said that in a couple of the podcasts, What I that's what I really love about this uh, community is that everyone's coming to it with different yeah. skill sets and it takes all of that. And how many industries are there like that in America where it's right. still, you know, so um, it's still yeah. on the edge, right? If you're, yeah, it's computer chess or it's chestnuts, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. We had a, we had a guy call me just cause he found out my name from, you know, a friend of a friend of a friend out here and they wanted a container load of chestnuts to Japan. Um, and they were going to pay 12 bucks a pound delivered there. Dang. And it was like, so I called around because I know a few people, but we couldn't get a container load. But they don't like Korean chestnuts. They really want Oregon or Washington chestnuts, and they were willing to pay for it. I mean, that's a quarter million dollars in a container. Oh, I know. It's just, it's, uh, it's just unbelievable. It, it, it's not easy. It's no one should listen to these 
conversations or read and think it's simple. It's not, it's expensive. Yeah. It's hard work. There's a lot of learning curves, but there's so many upsides to it as well. And, yeah. um, well, so, okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share that maybe new, newer folks, especially might want to hear? Well, I, uh, the, I, I think the most sentient thing that I've read on chestnuts is, uh, uh, Washington Chestnut Company, they're online. And Bernie, uh, who, who I've talked to a time or two and done a little business with, he's kind of out of business. But he has this, you know, how to raise chestnuts thing. And chapter eight or nine or ten or something is entitled Killing Chestnuts. And uh, he goes through that list. And because that's one thing that I have learned is that chestnuts are, are just very, and he just goes through all the different ways that you can kill chestnuts. And it's like, yeah, it's, they're not, they're not, they're not hard, but they're not simple. And mm -hmm. there's just so many. And I just thought, yeah, that's been my experience. I've, I got more dead trees all over the Pacific Northwest from bad ideas I had or, um, or something somebody told me and it didn't work. And, uh, so anyway, I, I just really, I thought that was one of the most honest things I'd ever heard about chess. It's, it's, it's so true. It's so true. Well, what we'll do is we'll we'll get a couple of the references and maybe even talk to Sawyer for a minute for the for the blog that will go with this podcast, so okay. we can share yeah. share information about um, what y'all are doing and 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 where people can buy things if they want to, yeah. And just you know know who you are and follow you. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, West WestCoastChestnut dot com, and okay. you can see some pictures and uh, and order some trees there if you want and. Um, yeah, he's taking orders now. It's really, I don't know. It, I'm glad he's doing the business part because. <laughs> yeah, for for, for sure. I like well, plants. He likes business, so we got a great there, deal. There going. you go. That's why we have kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, Craig, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it, and we'll look forward to sharing this with everyone. Okay. Hey, thanks. Good to talk to you, Millie. Good to talk to you too. Okay. Bye bye. So, is there any more to that?